Hello and welcome to episode 233 of the Thinking LSAT podcast in South Lake Tahoe, Nevada. I'm Nathan Fox with me in Vienna, Virginia, Ben Olson. Yeah, that's correct. What's happening on the other side of the country? Uh, I was just about to cough, but um, so I'm recovering from a sickness that got me this weekend. Oh, no. Yeah. Coronavirus? I hope so, because then I will obviously not die since I'm getting better, and then I'll be immune to it. Nice. Yeah, uh -huh. that's a good way to think about it. Yeah, although I guess it's not good, because then I could give it to someone else. and You blah, could lose blah, blah. one or more of your kids, but you have four of them. So I'm pretty sure I got it from them. You got though, extras. So. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah I was are. telling them that the other day. I was like, you know, back in the day, you know, I don't know, sometimes people had lots of kids because they might lose a couple. Yeah, what'd they say about that? They're like, yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> You know, kids are exposed to whatever environment they're exposed to, so they don't know what's normal or not normal. So, <laughs> so growing up with you, they yeah. yeah, they have very skewed ideas about what what life is supposed to be like. They're like, sure, sounds good, Dad. Is there food? <laughs> <laughs> Can we eat now? Fend for yourselves, kids. Yeah, got to make you strong. Uh, what's today, going on? oh, nothing. I just got back. I've been on vacation. You know, I'm, I'm just trying to. Uh, catch up. I don't take very many vacations, but this was a pretty wild, um, you know, I was telling you last time about my nine hour road trip that I had to go on to get to Oregon for golf. Um, <clears throat> so like, yeah, I like skied last Wednesday, drove to Oregon on Thursday, played golf, played golf Friday, Saturday, Sunday, played golf Monday, drove back here to my buddy's place in Tahoe and then skied a little bit yesterday. <laughs> I started working again yesterday and then skied a little bit yesterday. And then uh, today I'm finally going home. So I'll be home tonight and uh, I am catching up with all these demon requests. So I appreciate everybody for hitting the ask button. Um, yeah. I'll be caught up in a day or so. No big deal. Cool. All right. Great. Yeah. yeah good times. Um, it's odd that I choose my outdoorsiest time of the year for like February, you know. <laughs> in like the snow and rain and stuff. Yes, but, uh, although it's most likely related to LSAT slowdown, right? Like well, a, that's part of it. I mean, yeah, if this was like hot LSAT season, I would be, uh, I definitely would be working more. But I mean, the golf thing is like, I've got a group of 24 guys that we go to Oregon every February and play golf. Huh. Um, and yeah, I, I think, think you mentioned last time it was like rainy and cold. Oh, right. dude, we lucked out. It was supposed to rain on us. Even the forecast, while we were there, the forecast was like, yep, it's going to dump tomorrow. And uh, it didn't rain at all. Like, we <laughs> just, it like rained at night and didn't rain during the day. So we, we fully lucked out this year. But other years, we've had like snow delays or like hail and all kinds of crazy shit. Didn't you say you go at this time because it's like really cheap? Oh, yeah, totally. Yeah. This, this place that we go, um, it, it's like real expensive in the summertime. And uh, this group of guys, we just started going in the off season because the rates are like 50% of what they are normally. Yeah. So it does all come back to the weather. This is why you're going at the worst. Yeah. Time yeah. I mean, yeah, the reason why it's cheap <laughs> is because of the weather. <laughs> and we're going that, during that time you're because like, it's cheap. Hmm, why yeah. am I going now? I don't understand. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> We're not the smartest. Well, or we are. I don't know. We're frugal, yeah. I guess. Well, no. As long as you guys are having fun, who cares, right? Yeah. Uh, it's it's a blast. I mean, it's like several of my best friends, um, you know, people that I've known for my whole life or played golf with, you know, since like college. Um, there were multiple people there that I've known for more than 20 years. So, and even the guys that I don't really know, like the guys that I only know because of this trip, um, I've known them now for almost 10 years just because of going on the trip. So like I only hmm. see them once a year in Oregon, but yeah. it's like they're like a long lost friend kind of when I see them. So yeah, it's really cool. I would encourage uh, younger folks to look for opportunities to develop these sorts of annual traditions with your friends. I mean, I know it's kind of obvious people already do that, but um, it is cool looking back on stuff like this, you know, 20 years later or 10 years later and going, oh, wow, yeah. Same group of people. Everybody's yeah. like grayer now and looking a little f fatter, but <laughs> <laughs> so it's a good time. 
Cool. Uh, today on the show, we have a uh, review of the podcast, review of the demon. We won't spend too much time on, on that. Uh, we have a pearls versus turds. Someone's asking us, Ben, if question types are all just hype and if we should just ignore question types entirely. So we'll get to that in okay. pearls versus yeah. turds. Sure. Um, someone asked, this could have been a pearls versus turd as well. Someone asked if... Uh, the fourth logic game is easier than the third logic game. And they want to know if they should maybe like scan the third, the fourth game before they do the third game so that they can decide mm. which one is. Yeah. We're, we're going to give a hard no to that, but we'll get into the, the sure. reasons why. Okay. Someone sends an email kind of an SOS uh, that their score isn't going up. Um, According, though, to their stats, they've only done about 20 hours worth of studying. <laughs> so, <laughs> it's all right. We'll, we'll, a little perspective yeah, going here. Yeah, we'll, mm-hmm. we'll try to give you some perspective on that. We have an explanation that I guess a, a demon user liked, and then, Ben, you said you liked it as well. I um, liked that it had some family history in it, your family history. <laughs> yeah, we're going to talk so, about my grandpa Herb Okay, uh, a little bit. Yep, Herb Fox. That's right. Um we have an update from a student of mine. Oh, yeah, the student asked some questions, and I, I just rather than pop off myself, I wanted to get your perspective. Sure. So I asked if it would be okay if we responded via podcast. I have a <laughs> funny email that I got. I recommended, um, I wrote a letter of recommendation for uh, Matt because, you know, Matt works for us. And sure. Yeah. So I wrote a I wrote a letter of recommendation and I got back a thank you letter from the school that I just thought was kind of kind of interesting. That is interesting. Mm-hmm. Are you going to read the thank you letter on the show? Mhm. Oh, good. I want to hear it. Yeah, I want to hear what they had to say. Yeah. Yeah, we'll get there. Um Okay. And then we have a question about religious law schools. Uh this show will air on Monday, February 24th. That means that you have about two weeks to register for the April LSAT. Um, Too late to register for the March 30th LSAT. By the time you hear this, the next LSAT that you can register for is April 25th. That's a Saturday test. And the deadline to register for that is Tuesday, March 10th. Uh, you can email the show anytime, help at thinkinglsat.com. We really appreciate your questions and comments. As you can tell, we basically build the show agenda around your um, questions, news items, pearls versus turds submissions, whatever else. So please uh, email help at thinkinglsat.com and get yourself onto our agenda. When you do that, if you want to send us a selfie, we'll uh, use your picture for our posts and social media and all that type of stuff. Please leave us a review on iTunes. Uh, Hitting the five stars helps a lot, but writing a word or two about the show helps even more. Um, I think that's it. Anything else you want to talk about preliminarily before we dive into the content? No. Thank you all for listening. Yeah. Thanks. Really appreciate it. This is remains the most satisfying, uh, gratifying part of what I do really like, this is my favorite part of my job. So, um, we couldn't do that without the listeners. (laughs) I mean, we could, I'm not, not (laughs) I'm not laughing at what you just said. I apologize. I just saw the end of the, the email and it says bag of dicks. I'm like, what is, (laughs) where is this going to (laughs) go? Okay. Why don't you go ahead and read it since you're already reading it? I get to read it. Uh (laughs) So you can say bag of dicks twice. Yep. That's what, yeah, thanks. Um, That's what I get for scanning this. But geez, that's going to stick out. Nathan and Ben, I wanted to email and say thank you for your podcast and for the LSAT demon. I began listening to your podcast two years ago when I was taking a terrible prep course at a nearby university. I didn't begin to see results on prep tests until I began using your free advice over the prep course. Hmm. Okay. It wasn't a Kaplan course, but it was really bad. The LSAT was a son of a bitch. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, here we go. Here's our salty email for the day. Yeah. The LSAT was a son of a bitch, but your advice and feedback on the demon really helped me believe that I could do it. I didn't score as well on the LSAT as I would have liked, but I applied anyway with solid letters of recommendation and a kick-ass personal statement. 
I will be attending Gonzaga Law with three-fourths of the tuition covered because I followed your advice with the personal statement. I will continue to listen to your podcast because I think your advice is invaluable to the admission process. Wait, hold up. I appreciate that you'll continue listening, but are you done applying? It sounds like you're going to be going to Gonzaga. So anyways, cool. Um, but I'm happy to have you continue listening. I think the podcast is affecting real change, and I hope LSAC is paying attention. This entire application process is made much more complicated by LSAC, and I'm just waiting for my final transcripts to go through before I tell LSAC to go suck a bag of dicks. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks again, Carissa. Uh, okay. Wait, why did we include this? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't know, because <laughs> we like <laughs> salty. <laughs> I don't know. We do like salty. Um Congratulations on getting in con- to Gonzaga and getting three fourths of the tuition covered. That is what we love to hear. Um, ask them for more money. Cool. Yeah. Do you say uh, ask them for more money? Yeah. Yeah. Why not? I mean, it's not over yet. It's I, not over pe- yet. At this time of year, I'm just surprised how many people are like making final decisions or thinking that they have to make a final decision. I think the schools are more than happy. In fact, I know the schools are more than happy for you to make your final decisions right now. But you don't have to make your final decisions right now. School doesn't start until September. Yeah. So that's true. You know, you're going to, you can tell Gonzaga that you're not quite sure about their offer yet. And if you do the math on it, you'll probably see that one quarter of the tuition is a lot still. And if you could get them to knock anything off of that, you'd be better off. So I don't know. I don't, I don't think you have to make up, make up your mind just quite yet. Yeah, just to keep in keep in mind um, too. You said that school doesn't start till September. Um, you you probably don't want to be in this boat. But if a school does offer you a full ride scholarship or something like that, then maybe it's okay. There are some people who are showing up to campus on the day school starts because the school accepted them and they decided to change their plans and move to wherever that school is and f- go to that school in part because some schools you know they lose people the the week before the the class is supposed to begin and it's like hey, well I'm not going to go there anymore and they have some open seats and uh anyways the point is is yeah. not that you should be planning on that but right. i'm just saying that the process is not over till it's over yeah and then people get confused too because our advice about applying early and applying broadly doesn't change you should apply very early in the cycle you should apply broadly but then you should the, the kind of the point of that is that you want to get strong offers as early in the cycle as you possibly can so that you have more time to renegotiate the offers that you get. Um, there's a, there's a, what Ben was talking about is this last minute thing that happens. I mean, yeah, we've heard stories about people getting admitted to Harvard on like September 1st, you know, somebody yeah. withdrew. So Harvard had one more spot. So they offer that spot to somebody who was going to go to Georgetown Yeah, And now that person just like, oh shit, I'm in at Harvard. Okay, that's it. I'm walking away from a full semester of tuition at like Georgetown. Yeah. And we're not saying this is a good decision. We're just saying this is something that people do sometimes. Yeah. And so somebody says, you know what? It's worth it for me to walk away from a semester of tuition that I've already paid at Georgetown, get on a, you know, next flight, fly to Boston and show up at the first day of school or the second day of school at Harvard. And so now Georgetown has a spot open. Yeah. And maybe they offer that to somebody who was going to, I don't know, George Washington. Yeah. You know, and then it, so it can, obviously we're talking about extremes here, but that can happen at the last minute. And so, I mean, and, and if that can happen in September, then obviously it can also happen in, oh, June or yeah. March, you know? And so when, when Carissa here is, you know, saying she's made up her mind that she's going to go to Gonzaga, mm, I don't know. I mean, I, I think you got plenty of time to keep renegotiating here. Yeah, plenty of time to potentially get other offers. Yeah. This is not permission to apply in March, by the way. 
This is permission <laughs> or encouragement to negotiate in March. Yes, this is difference between negotiating in March and applying in March. Anyway, okay, that it for cool. Carissa. That's it. Thank you for writing in. Thank you for listening and yada yada. Yeah, thanks, Carissa. Um, and I don't know that you need to tell LSAC to go suck a bag of dicks. They seem to be, you know, nice individuals over there. Even if the behemoth organization tends to act in ways that make it look like they don't care. Um, the individual folks over there are humans who are trying to do the best they can, I think. So, yeah. Um, all right. Pearls versus turds, the scoreboard right now, so far we have covered, man, can you believe we've done so many of these, Ben? Um, there are seven, we have identified seven pearls, 28 turds, hmm. and, and there have also been 13 ties. Yeah, so we've done 48 of them. Yeah, this is this is Pearl versus Turd number 49. Wow. I can't wait to get to Pearl versus Turd number 50. So we're, we're batting at 14%. It's not good. Yeah. No. Not good. These are bits of received wisdom from around the internet, and Ben and I talk about them and decide whether we like the tip or hate the tip. Mostly we hate the tips, but anyway, here we go. <laughs> <laughs> it says, uh, hi, Annalisa. Oh, that's a dot, our producer, Nathan and Ben. During the past few months of studying for the LSAT, I have noticed the seemingly inordinate amount of time dedicated to the topic of question types in basically every source of prep material. The more I study, the more convinced I become that this is a waste of time. Placing so much emphasis on the type of question you are answering basically requires you to do twice the work for each question. First, you figure out what type of question you're answering, and then you answer it. Why not just read and understand the stimulus and then answer the question correctly? This has led me to believe that the following suggestion is a pearl. Here it is. This is the pearl versus turd. You ready? <laughs> okay. There is one type of question on the LSAT, the choose the correct answer type. I'll read it all and then we'll then we'll discuss. Okay, all right. Sure. Yeah. On the podcast, I have heard each of you allude to a similar conclusion, such as when Nathan suggests that many of the question types can be considered must be true questions or that questions are either top down or bottom up. Ben suggested that while he isn't in love with question type hype, he feels that a common vocabulary is necessary to be able to discuss questions more thoroughly along with certain strategies that can be used for certain question types. Even if what Ben says is valid, I still think time spent worrying about question types is better spent simply practicing understanding what you read and choosing the correct answer. Thank you so much for all the resources you provide. Using primarily this podcast, Nathan's books, and more recently, The Demon, I have improved my practice test scores from a 160 to a 176. I think The Demon is all anyone needs to reach their maximum potential score. C. Thanks, well, C. Thanks. Yeah, mm -hmm. really yeah. appreciate that. I a thousand percent agree with you that the demon is all anyone needs to reach their maximum potential score. Yeah. I mean, that's the purpose of what I do these days is to support the demon. And all I want is people to just do the demon all the time. Yeah. And it, it is meant to be everything you could possibly need. So <laughs> if you're going to tell me, Nathan, I'm never taking your classes and I'm never doing any tutoring. I'm just doing the demon all the time. I'm like perfectly fine with that. In fact, that's better. Like, yeah, do that. Yeah. Um, what do you think about this? Uh, Pearl versus turd. I've, pr I'll just tell you provisionally, Ben, my vote right now is a tie. Yeah, I, I, I have to agree. I think that, um, there's some problems with the turd. I mean, sorry, with the turd, uh, with the advice itself. I mean, I I, I kind of sh shy away from this kind of choose the correct answer. Like that itself turns me off a little bit because <laughs> well, it has no substance, right? Like that's obvious. Is that a tautology? What is, uh, I don't know, actually. I don't remember what tautology is. The saying of the same thing twice in different words generally considered to be a fault of style. A statement that is true by necessity. Yeah, in logic terms. A statement that is true by necessity. Yeah. Or by virtual, virtue of its logical form. I think sometimes tautology is used to refer to circular reasoning, where all you do is just say the same thing twice. Like you just say, sure. you know, your conclusion, and then you say your conclusion again, and then you pretend like you did logic. Yeah. 
this isn't that. This is something that's so obvious as to be meaningless. Yeah. I actually kind of wish that the, the, the que- well, I understand this person's focusing on the question type, but like this is focusing on choosing the correct answer as opposed to focusing on maybe some sort of action, like either just uh, like focus on understanding the passage or focus on understanding the question that they're asking you and just answering it. In any case, I do I do want to talk about some things here. I, I, I appreciate that C has seriously listened to the show yeah. and considered what we've had to say about it. And I think that there is a lot of value in this, in the sense that whenever I start teaching my class, I'm telling people, look, let's just focus on understanding each sentence in this argument and then understanding how the sentences relate to each other because i often find myself like i'll read the first sentence okay oh okay i get what you're trying to say there then i'll read the second sentence okay i get what you're trying to say there and if there's any connection and there usually is i try to put them together myself right i'm like okay well if these two things are true what must be true given what was said i don't want to go any further i don't want to jump to conclusions but you know i'm doing this work in the passage and then when i'm finally done with the passage i know whether it's an argument or a set of facts i know that if it is an argument what i think of it like where's the conclusion and do i think that conclusion is is good or bad it's just kind of a rough assessment sometimes but it's like yeah i, I don't think they did a great job of proving that conclusion that's usually the case and Sometimes I have a reason why. And that work, I tell people, is like maybe 80%. I mean, I'm just guessing. I'm just throwing out a number. But like 80% of your score is going to depend on that assessment right there. And we can talk about question types later. Like if you're having a problem with some question, it, it may have to do with the question type. But a lot of times it just has to do with your failure to understand and digest and analyze the passage in a thoughtful way. And so I, I like the sentiment of this. That said, um, I think that if someone knows what they're being asked, it, it can just add a clarity to the situation that makes it easier to choose between the most tempting wrong answer and the correct answer in a lot of cases. Yeah. It's a pearl. Uh, by the way, we're only talking about logical reasoning here. Um, I don't bother with question types on reading comp and I don't bother with question types on logic games. I don't even think about it. I only think about question types when it comes to logical reasoning. And I assume that that's what C is really referring to here. When people waste a lot of time talking about question types, it's almost always on logical reasoning. Yeah. To the extent that C is saying, Hey, read the damn argument, understand what they're trying to say, and then go answer the question. Um, I totally agree with C. If anybody is trying to convince you that you should read the question stem first and then read the argument, then I, you know, I am a thousand percent in favor of C's advice here, which is bullshit. Question types don't matter until you already understand the argument. Yeah. If that's what C's saying, then I'm a hundred percent on board with this tip. Yeah. Then it's a pearl. Then it's a pearl. Okay. Cause if you understand the argument and what's wrong with it, or if you just understand the argument that's being made, then it's real easy to answer lots of different types of questions. And half of the time, or more, 80% of the time, I think you said, Ben, yeah, you're going to already know the answer no matter what question they ask you because you're going to have a real good handle on what argument is being made. Yep. That said, we don't waste time talking about shit that we don't think is important. <laughs> and Ben and I have spent a lot of time talking about question types on the logical reasoning. I am writing explanations for the demon every single day. And when I write those explanations for the demon, I almost always am talking about the question type and how that can help you to get to the correct answer. Yeah. Like if you don't think there's a difference between sufficient assumption questions and necessary assumption questions, mm, I hate to break it to you, (laughs) but you're, you're just not going to ever achieve your maximum potential if you don't know the difference between those two types. Yeah. And so, um, Yes, it's true that many question types are in the must be true family. Yes, it's true that, you know, top down versus bottom up is a thing and that you can there's there's shortcuts. But <clears throat> how do you put something into the top down or bottom up categories if you don't really understand that question type in the first place? 
Yeah, I don't know. It just it it matters. <laughs> the question types yeah. do matter. Yeah, the skills definitely overlap quite a bit. Um, I was actually just last night we did a bunch of uh, must be true and supported and actually disagree questions in class, um, and I was I was just diving into those and trying to help people understand like okay, it must be true. You're just looking for something that has to be true. It's the most boring, basic answer, right? And so as we're talking about these and we're going through the wrong answers, it must be true question, by the way, for those of you who aren't totally familiar, it says something like, if the statements above are true, if the statements in the passage are true, which one of the following answers must also be true? And the wrong answers tend to either introduce things that weren't talked about in the passage, or they may talk about things that were discussed in the passage, but they go a little too far. Like maybe the passage talked about some snakes, and answer choice B talks about most snakes. It's like, well, we know this is true for some, but do we know that it's true for most? We don't necessarily know that it's true for most, so this answer is wrong. It took the information and then it ran with it a little too far. So in any case, as we're going through these answer choices, I start telling people, okay, well, A, this is wrong because, look, we never talked about you know birds. Like That's new information. This is out. Then B, oh, this is out because it says most. We don't know about most snakes. We only know about some. And we go through all the answers and we come to the correct answer. And, and I pause and I'm like, look, the thing about must be true questions is if you can get really good at these and really get good at identifying what is a legitimate conclusion from the passage, something that you could logically conclude or infer from this information, you're going to get a lot better at a whole bunch of other question types because in flaw questions, strengthen questions, weaken questions, necessary assumption questions, sufficient assumption questions, parallel flaw questions, you're given an argument in the passage. And when you f- read the conclusion, wherever it is, um, let's assume for the sake of argument right now that it's at the end of the passage. When you read that conclusion, you should look at it just like you're looking at all these answer choices in a must be true question and be like, hey, is this something, is this conclusion something that must be true given what was said in the premises? And if not, uh, why not? Did it go too far? Did it introduce new information? Um, that's the flaw in the argument, right? Uh, the same could be true for intermediate conclusions. But the point is, is that all these question types are like slightly different from each other and asking for slightly different things, but the underlying skills definitely overlap. And I think that's one thing that maybe C is referring to. But in any case, that's just something I thought I'd throw out there. Sometimes people just don't see, they see these things. I think that's might be one problem with these books' obsession with them is that they almost like treat them as these isolated incident, you know, things that are unrelated to each other. It's actually, there's a lot of underlying similarity. At the end of the day, the test is just trying to figure out, can you figure out what was said? Right. Do you know what is implied by that logically, not just your own like gut, oh right. yeah, this is what I think must be true, and then running with that. Yeah, and they're they're putting the they put the cart before the horse a lot, right? Like they if they get students thinking about question types before they get them thinking about understanding the actual argument, then yeah, you're focusing on details that might not be required to answer this particular question correctly. Mm-hmm. I think about question types a lot more once I've already narrowed it down to two, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Or I'm going to read the argument, I'm going to attack the argument, I'm going to think about what's wrong with the argument, and then when I read the question, I'll make a prediction before I look at the answer choices, but my prediction is going to be slightly different based on you know subtle differences between the types of questions. Sure, yeah. For example, I mean, and most obviously, I suppose, if this is a supported question, or if it's a strengthened question, mm-hmm. you know, my prediction on a strengthened question is going to be worded more strongly on a strengthened question than it is on a supported question. Supported yeah. questions are top down, evidence based. The answers tend to be kind of boring, obvious, conservatively stated, right? Understated. Yeah. Strengthened questions are the exact opposite of that. You would prefer like a bigger, bolder answer. If you, yeah. narrowed it down, you narrow it down to two, if you absolutely can't tell, if you've narrowed it down to two, if it's a strengthened question, pick the stronger one. Yeah. But if it's a supported question, pick the weaker one. Yeah. So it really does matter. I mean, it makes me think of my buddy Mike. Okay. My buddy Mike, um, he is good with words. He writes uh, in the online division for ABC. 
We were cool. living in San Francisco a long time ago, and Mike came to my class one day because he wasn't sure what he was going to do with his life or whatever. So he decided to come to class and take a practice test. Totally blind, no prep, right? This is a straight cold practice test for my buddy Mike. And yeah. he scored like 164 or 165 or something on the very first practice test he ever took. Yeah, that's awesome. Well, he obviously doesn't know anything about question types. He's a smart guy who's good at words. And he was able to read the shit and just answer the answer most of them correctly. Yeah. He, by the way, decided he didn't want to be a lawyer. His wife's a lawyer. <laughs> and he never <laughs> took another LSAT ever again. He took one, you know, 164 cold and walked away from it. Yeah. But that, but he didn't score 174. He scored 164. Yeah. And so on the few that he missed, he probably didn't really grasp the difference between, you know, what are they looking for here? I'm sure he narrowed it down to a 50 50 and and got lots of those right. But he also narrowed some of them down to a 50 50 and got some of those wrong. Yeah. And a little bit of instruction about question types would have helped him turn that 164 into, I'm sure, a 170 something. And to the extent that he missed logical reasoning questions, it's almost guaranteed that it's because he didn't really understand the question types. So, Ty? Ty. Yeah, there's some, th- there's some good advice here. I mean, it, it, the first time you're reading the, arg- the argument, yeah, you shouldn't. I would prefer that you don't know what type of question it is. You shouldn't have read the question yet. I want you to read the argument first. So, yeah, so you can ignore question types while you're reading the argument. Yeah. But when you if it if it turns out to be a hard question, the 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 difference between a sufficient assumption question and a necessary assumption question, it it will absolutely be the difference between getting that question right and getting the question wrong. Yeah. So I'm sorry, you don't get to just ignore all the question types. <clears throat> Next one? Sure. It's Long you. time listener, yep. first time caller. I just took prep test 40, and after review, I found the fourth game much easier than the third. I've come across this doing other time sections as well. Is this the case with more of the older tests, or is it more infrequent with recent tests? Uh, I've been working through the 30s. Should I scan game four really quickly to gauge the difficulty level before moving on, or just go through them in order? Thanks, Andrew. First of all, this is a little bit random. The, sometimes the hardest game in the section is game three. Sometimes it's game four. Uh, there are four practice tests, or I should say official tests, because all the practice tests are just official tests that have been turned into practice tests. But there are four official tests where arguably the first game was the hardest game in the section. But given how many tests there are, that's pretty rare. So I would say in most tests, it's either going to be the third or fourth game. But to ask me which one do you think it is, fourth or third, I would say I, just, I don't really think about that. The only thing I say is go through the section, do the first game, do the second game, plan on doing the third game. And it's only if you're like really quickly, like, I don't know what the fuck is going on here, and you want to move on, I'm okay with that because it's like reordering the games. But other than that, I would say just plan on going through them. Uh, It's hard to assess whether a game is going to be easy or hard. There are some ordering games that have come forth that have been extraordinarily difficult. So, you know, people see those and they're like, yeah, sweet, ordering. And it's like, oh, (laughs) what is going on here? Um, So, yeah, my advice is always just plan to do them one through four. The only exception is if you instantly are like, huh, what's going on? I don't really care if you skip because it would just be like if the test writers had given you the other game before it. I don't want you skipping around more than once. You have one pass. As That's long right. As you, yep. Yeah. You have you have permission to pass on one game, but not with the intention of passing on that game, then also passing on a later game, then going back. Yeah. You need, we don't want you moving around. <laughs> no, I don't want you bouncing around because then you're just using a little bit of your time and a little bit of your brain power on the game, then giving up, going on to another one, and then doing that same thing on some other game. Like now you've answered no questions, but you've spent a little bit of time on two different games. Fuck that. Yeah. You, you need to plan on doing them in order. And I, yeah, if you're the type of person who's not going to reliably make it through all four games, then you're allowed to skip a game. 
Yep. But I can't imagine ever skipping game one. I mean, it's just not a success. You're just you're just not going to be successful if you're skipping game one. <laughs> yeah, it's not yeah. Well, not going to work out for you. I shouldn't have told you that those four tests probably had the hardest game first because now you'd be like, "This is my test." No, that's really I've seen rare, it, but it, that hasn't happened in a long ass time. By the way, that's on the older tests. Time. Yeah, and it, the other thing is that it is it's it's relative anyway, right? Like we're ta- we're we're pretending as if there's like an objective difficulty of games. Sure. But that's the that objective difficulty only comes from the aggregate of hundreds or whatever thousands of students, and you're just one student. And so, a game that most people found hard, you might find easy anyway. So, I think you need to presume that the games are going to get harder as you get deeper into the section. So, you should have a strong preference for doing game one before you do game two. Yeah, you should also have a strong preference for not wasting time. And anytime you're scanning through games, I think you're wasting time. I mean, Ben, you brought it up. There are sequencing games, which most people tend to master sequencing games first, right? Okay, I'm yep. good at sequencing games. I'm, I suck at everything else, but I can do sequencing games. Yep. Okay, well, let me show you this game where you had to rank, uh, you had to, it was only six cities, Vancouver, mm-hmm. Washington, New York. You, you know which game I'm talking about. Yeah. That game was game four, and it was a sequencing game and on its surface it looks really easy. The rules are easy to understand. Everything about it seems easy. Mm-hmm. And if you glanced at that, you might think it's the easiest game in the section. Yeah. But it was definitely the hardest game in the section. Yeah. Because the they can ask hard questions on an easy looking game. They can also ask easy questions on a hard looking game. Yeah. So if you think you're going to scan the games and tell which ones are easy and which ones are hard without wasting a lot of time, then you know there's two possibilities there one is you're better at the lsat than i am yeah two is you're wrong and i just think the latter hypothesis is much more likely than the former so yeah do them in order hey this discussion reminded me of uh last night partly because it's about you know going through the section and timing and all that but Two or three students came up to me after class and were like, look, I do really well on the questions that we do in class, um, but on Saturdays I don't always do as well. And I was like, well, a lot of the questions that we did tonight are pretty difficult. So did you, like, when you say you did well, like, what What do you, let's, let's have some numbers here. And they're like, yeah, I got them all right, except one or something like that. I'm like, oh, that's actually pretty good. Um, and so I was telling them, I was like, when you're going through the logical reasoning section, instead of thinking about this as a section and you have 35 minutes to do this section, I'd like you to think about each question as a mini test. So your job is to do the first question. That's your first test. And then once you're done with that test, you submit your answer and you move on to the next test, which is question two. Because it feels to me like you're able to do this when you're focused on one question, but when you're focused on multiple questions or the section as a whole, kind of like what Andrew's doing here, maybe with the games, um, you get out of like being present with that question or that game and you don't do as well. And you may not finish, but that doesn't matter. How many of these mini tests can you do in this section? And then you're done. I like that. Yeah. Like you don't get to do the next question if you don't get this one right. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like your test is just over. <laughs> yeah. I like that. Ready for this next email? Yeah, let's do yeah. it. Oh, thanks, by the way, Andrew, for that question. Okay. Oh, yeah, this is the one about a score not going up. Uh, it says, hi, I'm not sure who this kind of question should go to. I'm frustrated lately because my score has not changed on my practice tests since December. Every time I improve in what I thought was a weak area, it is balanced by not doing well on an area that I was previously doing well in. For instance, I was scoring very well in LR, in the demon, and time sections and tests, but I was not doing well in RC. I studied hard in RC and got it down to a minus three, but then was fatigued and rushed for LR and did poorly on those sections. I feel like I'm having trouble switching gears between sections and maintaining such intense focus for all the sections. Do you have any advice? I'm attaching screenshots of the LSAT demon for reference. 
I don't know why it says 156 hours for games. It must have been counting when the iPad was just left on. I'm aiming for the April test. Thanks, Shannon. So here we have a, a screenshot of like the landing page yeah. of Shannon's LSAT demon. And the first thing, I mean, I scanned down it and I saw 11 hours of logical reasoning, six hours of reading comp, and then the you know fake 156 hours of games, which was just yep. because she, whatever, left her computer running. Yeah. But my response to this, I'm, I'm imagining your response is going to be the same, is that if you've been studying since December, why have you only done 11 hours of LR? Yeah. When was this email sent? Well, presumably oh, recently, right? right? I, I, I guess, unless Annalise is putting real old stuff on. Oh, but anyway, the, the, the advice remains the same, you know, that yeah. you 11 hours of LR is a nice start. Yeah. But it's just a start. And same with reading comp. Like your your problem is just, I think, it's just volume. Yeah. You're looking at two, you're looking at limited data. You know, people do this all the time. This is like ultra common. This might be the most common question we even get. Yeah. You know, I've been studying for we had one on like the last show. Uh, you know, I've been studying for so long. I've been studying for three weeks and my score is not improving. What's going on? And it's like, well, you're just, that's still the short run. You're, you're, you, you don't know what the long run is yet because you haven't yeah. been at it long enough. Yeah. Yeah, I was just talking to someone yesterday too. They said they got a 148 initially, then they got a 155, and then they got a 150. And they're like, I don't know what I'm doing wrong. And I was like, you know, like honestly, these scores are going to fluctuate and five points is not anything crazy. Um, so plus or minus five. I mean, yeah, I think f when you take your first practice test, if you show up with a 150, that to me is not exactly a 150. It's a 145 to a 155. Yep. Yeah. And that's really how you should be treating every single one of these practice tests. Yeah. And official tests. Like when you go sit for the real thing and you get a 160, that's not, you know, I mean, yeah, it's a 160 on your permanent record. But that doesn't mean that it was a 160 performance. It means that it was a 155 to a 165 performance. And, you know, because there's just randomness. Sometimes you get yep. lucky, sometimes you get unlucky. Yeah, so more more work, really. That seems like the, the solution to me, too. You know, and my, my advice is always the same, too. When, when people say, you know, this, I studied hard in RC and got it down to a minus three, but then I was fatigued and rushed for LR. I feel like that's something that people say when they just haven't studied that much. Like that, it's like you're making an excuse. Like, well, I was focusing on this, and so then that's why my performance went down on this other thing. Yeah, I, I think. I mean, my hypothesis is that you're just not that good yet at any of it, and that you need to do more work. You need to be thinking about moving your averages up, not your individual performances, but your averages need to go up. I, I can kind of relate to this on some level. Like when I'm working out and I'm trying to do a certain number of pull-ups or push-ups in a certain time frame, sometimes I'll get like to a number I haven't gotten to before. And then the next day that I work out two days later or whatever, it will drop back down and I'll feel like, Oh, I'm like losing progress. But there, it's like, I always have to remind myself, you got to step back and look at the big picture. Like six months ago, I wasn't even right. close to this. Right. And it's, but there's this weird feeling of like, Oh, I hit that. So now that's where I am. And so any sort of regression from that is failure and I'm doing poorly and I'm making mistakes. It's like this person got to minus three in reading comp and now they kind of thought that that's where they were. It's like, that was one section um, how many of those questions that you got right, you got a little bit lucky on, especially reading comp. I mean, you can have a couple passages that you just get into and then that's a great section. And then there's another section where you're just like, what's yeah. this passage? And I'm totally. not getting it. So I, I would say, great, you're making progress, but don't look at that as like, you know, something in the mountain. Oh, that's how far, how high I am. And anything below that is, is me getting worse. Yeah, I can analogize to my um, like my golf game. You know, it's like some days I'm gonna hit driver great and putt like shit. Some days I'm gonna putt great and hit my drives like shit. Yeah, the truth is I'm just not that good at either of them. 
<laughs> like there's <laughs> there's a big range around my abilities which there's probably always going to be a, a range, you know, but yeah. it, it's like, I'm just not that good. So yes, some days it'll look like I'm good at one aspect or another aspect of my game. And some days I, it might look like I'm good at all aspects of my game, but on other days uh, it'll look like I'm shitty at all aspects of my game. The truth yeah. is I'm mediocre at all of it. Sometimes I do better and sometimes I do worse. And if I really wanted to improve, I would need to practice more. <laughs> I never practice. I only yeah. go and play. And so it's like, well, yeah, if if you want to be better at all aspects, then you just practice, <laughs> you practice all aspects. But yeah, like your working out analogy is perfect. And the golf analogy makes perfect sense too. Like if I went and hit drivers a lot, you know, I, I guess I, I would be getting better at my driving game overall. Mm -hmm. But even then, some days I'm going to hit it better and some days I'm going to hit it worse. And it doesn't mean anything. It's just kind of random. There's just randomness. It's just you can't control all of the individual outcomes. And individual outcomes, which can't be controlled, they tend, they can bunch up into, you know, lots of good ones or lots of bad ones. Yeah. But it doesn't have to mean anything. It's just randomness. You sh I always just love saying, hey, look, go back to what you got wrong and figure it out, unpack it. It's like a great opportunity to learn something about yourself. Yeah. This one right here, why did I miss it? Yep. People love to talk about the big picture stuff. Like they think that there's got to be some overarching solution, right? Yeah. Like if I could just figure out this one systematic thing, then I would get them all right. And it's like, no, the big systematic thing isn't the problem. The, the problem is this question right here that you missed. Why did you do that? Yeah. Why don't you understand that? Why didn't you understand that question? Do you understand it now? Yeah. So I think everybody needs to, everybody like wants to solve the forest, right? Mm -hmm. But instead I think they actually do need to look at the individual trees. Yeah. And just, you know, it's, it's that one game right there, or it's that one reading comprehension passage, or it's that one LR question. Yeah. And then another one after that and another one after that. So it looks like Shannon has done several sections here. So, oh, I didn't even see those screenshots. Yeah, okay, yeah. So we've that's got that's nice. I mean, they are still kind of spread out. It looks like it's every like one to three days, which is not bad if you're doing drilling in between and maybe a time section, you know, once a week or something. I don't know how much you're actually doing. It's a little hard to tell exactly. Well, look on completed tests. I mean, yeah. it's five tests between the end of December and the middle of February. Yeah. So that's less than, you know, that's a test every other week or something like that. I mean, and that's then on not time horrible if she's doing time sections. Let's see. How, yeah, how many sections does she have here? I'm not saying it's horrible. I'm saying she's getting outworked, though, by lots of other people. Well, I, this actually may not, in my mind, this may not be too little. I'm worried that she's not, like, reviewing enough, I guess. Like, either you need to be doing more of these or you need to be reviewing more of what you're doing i'm wondering right like i think it's a total of less than 10 tests yeah in more than 10 weeks and oh, or about yes. 10 weeks yeah. 10 tests in 10 weeks yeah. so it's just i think all she it's just you've scratched the surface it's great you've gotten a start yeah but you haven't done the work yet. I know it looks, you know, you've done some work, but you haven't done the work. <laughs> and this is all just still short range. This is very, this is, this is not enough data to make any types of conclusions other than you need, you just need to keep it up. You need to potentially pick up the pace. Or if you're going to keep up this pace of, you know, one test a week, then you just need to expect that your LSAT prep process is going to take six months. I mean, that's, I think you're doing well. I mean, I think you're doing the right stuff. I think if you keep doing sections and tests and drilling in the demon, I think it will, you will show improvement. But right now, I don't, I don't think you've put in quite the effort to really be trying to draw any big picture conclusions. Yeah. I, the short run is a lot longer than people think it is. This to me is still the short run. This is just not, I don't, I can't learn anything from this data. Yeah. 
if you started asking me individual questions, then I'd be able to assess, you know, more about your, what you do and what you don't understand. But like when you just are looking at only the like aggregate data of your performance, then I don't know, it just seems like this is a nice start and you got to do more. Yeah. <clears throat> you want to get to this explanation? Yeah, let's do it. Do you want to read this since it's your sure. grandfather? I don't know who suggests somebody gave us a compliment and then you and Annalisa both were like, yeah, yeah, this is a great explanation. Let's put it in the, put it in the show. So anyway, yep. this is that question. A lot of, I think people might be familiar with this question. It's from prep test 67. It's the one about paper Crete. Um, and I was, uh, I wrote an explanation that sounded like this. It says my grandpa Herb toad Fox came from Oklahoma on a bus looking for work at age 14. He ended up getting his eighth grade diploma at the same time my dad was graduating from high school. He wore overalls and worked his ass off every day of his life. All of that is true, Ben, including his nickname, which actually was Toad. We didn't call him Toad, but apparently people growing up called him Toad. Okay, cool. And he did immigrate out of Oklahoma in the Dust Bowl looking for work. Hmm. He like grew up in a shack with a dirt floor and uh, came to California to do like agricultural labor. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's pretty wild. Anyway, Herb was fond of home quote improvement projects and owned a big ramshackle lot on the edge of town on which to tinker. He added several ramshackle rooms to his own house and was constantly wrenching on cars or conjuring up some new DIY invention or other. His primary media were duct tape and bailing wire. He was a true proud Oki in every sense of the word. I'm happy to have his blood. Anyway, this question makes me think of Herb because Herb is exactly the type of dude that would have loved something called papercrete. I bet Herb would have used it for everything. Patch a wall? Sure. Patch the roof? Why not? Build a whole damn house out of it? Hell yeah, this stuff's great. Herb would have used papercrete every day and would have been very familiar with its properties. If you would have asked Herb how to replace the aging western span of the Oakland Bay Bridge, Herb would have suggested papercrete. I'm sure of it. Alas, Herb was not a civil engineer or a materials engineer or any sort of engineer, although his overalls did make him look like a railroad engineer. Herb wasn't about to win the contract to replace any bridges. Asking Herb for his opinion on papercrete for bridge replacement would have been a mistake. Just because someone uses a certain material a lot doesn't mean they're qualified to testify on that material's promise for things they've never used it on. That's the entire point of this question. It's a flaw question, so we're looking to identify the thing the argument did wrong, I'm looking for relying on the testimony of the wrong so-called experts. Nice. Anything else we should know about Herb? <laughs> oh, man. Um, he smoked cigarettes probably since childhood. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. He smoked cigarettes like constantly until my sister, when she was like five, asked him to stop. Huh. And he stopped smoking cold turkey, <laughs> just never smoked again. Wow. <laughs> he had he had smoked cigarettes. I mean, pack a pack a day, got to be a pack a day or more than a pack a day. He had smoked cigarettes every day for 50 years. Wow. And then he just stopped. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, it's funny that you're, you're mentioning that reminded me of a story when I was about five, I was in the airport with my mom and apparently someone was smoking. So I guess it was still okay to smoke indoors <laughs> back then. Yeah. And yep. I went up to them and I said, you know, sir, it's not healthy to smoke. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> Oh, man. And my mom was like, I'm glad you don't think it's good to smoke, but... <laughs> <laughs> oh, jeez. I don't know. I mean, no one got upset. I mean, sure, I was five. He was probably like, yeah, okay, whatever, kid. But, yep, I was concerned. I saw someone smoking, and I had been taught that smoking is not healthy. So I wanted <laughs> to let him know. That's awesome. But I'm glad Herb responded to your sister. You you only have one sibling, right? Yep, just a little sister. That's it. Cool. Yeah, Herb was uh he was quite a dude. It's amazing when I look at, you know, what my life is now compared to what my grandparents 
lives were like all four of my grandparents um, <clears throat> worked their asses off. I mean, like agricultural labor style. Yeah. yeah. None of them went to college. They all got married very young. They all had kids very young. They all just worked their asses off every day. Um, yeah. So I'm very grateful to be able to use my brain for a living instead of using my body for a living. <laughs> you do a tiny little bit of agricultural labor and you will decide that you do not want to do that shit ever again. Yeah. You should make your kids do some uh, work on the farm, Ben. We did have kids, uh, chickens at one point, and they collected the eggs in the morning, but that's easy, you know? It, actually, it's not. <laughs> I mean, there was a decent, like, you know, chickens, they produce a lot of shit, and um, yeah. you have to shovel that off of their little shelf where it starts to pile up. They don't clean up after themselves, apparently. And uh, so, yeah, the kids had to do that. They did not like doing that. Or, you know, they did it halfway. You go outside, you're like, ah, dude, there's still a lot of shit on this row. Can you come get that again? So that was that was good. Yeah. My dad took care of pigs in the morning. He said he had to get up every morning really early. And if he didn't do it, because my grandparents owned a farm. And, uh, yeah, he said that he learned a lot of, like, responsibility. Because sometimes he would, I don't know, not do it and it was really cold because it was up in idaho right up in the panhandle and um i don't know something would happen bad things would happen and then of course my grandpa would be like yelling at him butch <laughs> that's not my dad's name that was his nickname so <laughs> <laughs> butch i like that <laughs> yeah so there's lots to be learned from farming but how else could how how could we have kids do farming stuff around here it's so urban yeah, I suppose you're going to have a hard... Well, just I guess what I mean is have them do labor ha, or just have them work, period. Yeah. Like I also had to work in a pizza place when I was in high school and mm. I worked at the bowling alley when I was in college. And, you know, I've just like done a lot of customer service jobs and a lot of... I don't know. I just I have some hard work under my belt and I feel like it <clears throat> makes me better at the, you know, not that hard work. <laughs> that I do now or it makes me more appreciative of, of the options that I have. Like when I see people in my classes, I've said this before, when I see people in my classes, like really complaining about the LSAT, you know, it's so hard, it's so taxing. It's like on one hand, I feel you, you're, you know, you're doing something that's challenging to you and, and it's stressing you out. Okay. I, I get that. But on the other hand, you're in a climate controlled environment, you know, sitting on a padded chair working on some logic game puzzles <laughs> and it's like <laughs> how bad really is your life if you're you know you're a college student or a college graduate who is uh considering graduate school um it's like you've already won the lottery of life yeah yeah and um i don't know i think sometimes students can um take some motivation for that or at least get some perspective by looking back at what their parents or grandparents went through. Cause I'm quite sure that your life is better than <laughs> if not your grandparents, your great grandparents. Yeah. You know, <laughs> like it shouldn't be that many generations that you go back, um, of, uh, well, I don't know, whatever, maybe you come from oil barons or something. But, uh, <laughs> I did not. <laughs> yeah. Hmm. Yeah. That's good. Uh, that's good perspective. Yeah. Whoever sent this in, thank you for pointing out, an explanation that you enjoyed. I do get a lot of motivation from that. Um, I'm filling up the demon logical reasoning with uh, explanations that are as useful and creative as I can, because I want to try to make the uh, process less painful for you. So hopefully you'll find other fun stories in the demon as you keep practicing. Yeah. You want to read this uh, update slash question from sure. my student? Yes. Hi, Nathan. I hope you have been well since we last spoke. I wanted to give you an update on my application process and ask you a few questions. As you may remember, I applied previously in 2018 and was not accepted to any of the schools I applied to, UCLA, USC, and NYU. After taking your class, I increased my LSAT high score from 165 to 170, and so far this cycle has been going much better, thanks in large part to your help through your class and podcasts! Exclamation point. I am still waiting on about eight schools, but my current status for the ones I have heard from is as follows. Accepted. USC. Loyola. Nearly full scholarship, by the way. And USD. Nearly full scholarship. 
Uh, waitlisted, Georgetown, UCLA, Columbia, Michigan. I have two quick questions that I was wondering if you could help me with. It's, it's weather, by the way, but uh, <laughs> most people don't know that, so I, I just always am changing it in my own writing. Anyways, one, as you can see, I have a few wait lists and may get more. At what point should I send my first letter of continued interest and how often should I plan to send them? Ooh, uh, okay. Well, maybe we should tackle this question before going on to the next one. I would say send your letter of continued interest right away. To me, that uh, shows that you're serious. They just told you you were waitlisted, and you're like, okay, uh, great. Well, I'm still interested in you. If you don't respond, I think it kind of sends a message like you don't care. <laughs> or it just makes you look like you're not as good at like life. I mean, yeah. when people take forever to respond to emails or take forever to return phone calls or whatever, they just you just look like you're not that effective of a person. So you need to become someone who is just fucking on it. That's what lawyers look like. My friend Nikki Black, <laughs> who has been on the podcast before, she works her ass off as an attorney. And I know I talk about her a lot. But one thing about Nikki that is so fucking amazing is that we'll be sending around emails about Dungeons & Dragons about like scheduling for Dungeons and Dragons. Yeah. And she's like always the first one to reply. I guarantee she works harder and does more shit than I do or than anyone in our game. And she's also the first one to reply about a non-essential item like when are we scheduling D&D. <laughs> it's because she's better at life. Like she she just manages her shit. Yeah. And so, yeah, if they waitlist you and you the very next day or that day send a letter, you know, specifically mentioning their school and saying, hey, I, you know, I'm, I'm very, I'm very interested in coming to this school. Let me know if you need any more information or whatever. Yeah. I think you look like a baller. You know, I think they immediately put you into like, why are they waitlisting you in the first place? One of the reasons why they waitlist you is for yield protection. Maybe we should They're elaborate waitlist. on that for anyone who doesn't yeah. know what yield protection is. Yeah, yield protection is they want people to say yes to them because this is a metric that they have to report to. Do they report that to the bar? Is that like a 509 thing? Well, it I, is on the 509. So yeah, yeah they report it to the bar. Yeah, I think in US News and Report, US News and World Report gets that number from their yep. their reporting to the ABA. Yep. Yeah. Yep. So they they say here's how many students we admitted and here's how many students accepted our offers of admission. And one of the ways that they try to boost that number, the yield number, is they put you on the wait list and wait for you to say, hey, I am still interested. Yeah. This is one reason, actually, if you're overqualified for a school, you might get waitlisted. <laughs> yeah. Which confuses people because they're like, wait, I don't understand. Why did I get waitlisted here? Because they know you're not going to go there. <laughs> Unless they waitlist you and you're like, oh, please help. I would like yeah. to go to your school. They can also waitlist you as part of the scholarship negotiation. They want to make you feel bad. They want to make you feel like, oh, I, I'm barely squeaking into this school. So, of course, they're not going to give me a scholarship. Yeah. But that's dumb because once they admit you, then you can start talking about the money. You know, I, I think you send that letter of continuing interest right away. What do you think about how often should I plan to send them? I don't know that I would send another one and become annoying. Instead, I would follow up this email and say something like, can I schedule a visit to the school? That shows that you're serious. You can meet people in person in the admissions office. Hopefully you <laughs> present a good presence and that uh, furthers your likability. Um, you can ask them to talk to alumni or current students about the school. Just do things that get you involved with them in different ways so that you don't just seem like you're sending letter after letter. I'm still yeah. interested. I'm still interested. Okay, great. Um, there if are you other have, ways to connect with people without yeah, seeming yeah. annoying. If you have something new, to report to them, you can do that. Like what you get your grades back for the semester. Yep. You know, I can imagine this happening in on May 31st, you're still on the wait list, but now you've got your grades for your final semester and they're all straight A's. Yeah. 
you send them a note saying, Hey, you know, just wanted to let you know that I'm still uh, interested. I, you know, I'm, I'm hoping to attend this fall. I did just got my final transcripts and here's my grades for the final semester of my undergrad. Thought you might find that useful. Thanks. Bye. Yeah. Or you get a promotion at work or you get a, some something published or I don't know any like new accomplishment or achievement or whatever. Right. It seems yeah. like you, you could update them on that, especially if you've made a friend. Mm-hmm. Okay. Next question. Yeah. I have been completing my FAFSA and I'm trying to understand whether I need to provide my parents information as I have been financially independent since graduating undergrad. However, I noticed that some schools require you to provide parents information like UCLA and some do not like USC. Do you have any advice on this? Oh, I mean, I I don't know what the rules are. I would just read whatever the rules are. I think schools can require that information even if FAFSA does not. Yeah, they, I, I'm sure that there are legal limits on what they can ask you, but they can probably just ask you for most information that they want. This could be a, like that. Maybe that's a UC thing mm. where the UCs are more, con- more, in- more concerned with how much money your parents have because they're going to do a little more of like the need based analysis when they're figuring out how much money to give you. Yeah. Maybe USC just doesn't give a shit. <laughs> <laughs> Private school charges a bazillion dollars. <laughs> Um, yeah, I didn't, I, I, I didn't have any really advice on that point. So I thought maybe you would have something brilliant to say, but sorry, looks like we're both striking out on that one. Sorry. Go ahead and send your letter of continuing interest right away. As far as like answering questions, um, I think probably you just have to answer whatever they ask you. Yeah. I don't know. You could email UCLA for that. Like you've already, uh, been waitlisted. I don't know. Can you get in touch with UCLA and say, Hey, I noticed this question on the FAFSA. I've been financially independent from my parents for years. Do I, is this a question that you're really concerned with? Yeah. I don't know. That seems like a reasonable thing to ask them. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, you probably ask the school. All right. Um, and that's anonymous. So thanks anonymous, uh, schools, thanking recommenders. Okay. This came from Richmond, uh, University of Richmond School of Law. I don't know how much we'll have to say about this, but I just found it interesting. Dear Nathan Fox, on behalf of the University of Richmond School of Law, we want to take this opportunity to thank you for writing a recommendation letter on behalf of Matthew Dumont. <laughs> it's Matt here in <laughs> LA. Okay. Each, each year, the sheer volume of applications for an extremely limited number of available spots makes the admissions decision challenging. Two spaces between sentences. Hmm. While a candidate's <laughs> GPA and LSAT score are certainly factors in the decision process, the admissions committee with caps on admissions committee that's annoying. Values the information you provide about the character and distinguishing qualities of each applicant. Your letter of recommendation is invaluable in providing the committee with a more personal look into the life of an applicant and the applicant's likelihood of success in law school. Thank you again for taking the time to share your insights and for helping us in making our admissions decisions. If you would like any additional information about Richmond Law or have any questions at all, please do not hesitate to contact us. Sincerely, that came from Michelle Heck, who is an associate dean of admissions in the Office of Admissions at University of Richmond School of Law. Interesting. So I guess Richmond, they're hoping Virginia. that your their kind um, totally outreach to you will get back to Matt, and Matt will be like, "Oh, what a great school. totally, yeah, yeah." That's what I thought. I mean, it's just I love watching law schools hustle. Yeah. It's fun to watch the law schools hustle. Yeah. So I guess I wanted to share this with the listeners, just because it's like, hey look how hard these schools are fighting to try to get you to come to their school. Yeah. Now, Matt's a great candidate, right? Great LSAT score, great personal statement, lots to recommend Matt for, but <laughs> there's no way. I mean, they're, they're clearly sending this letter to everybody who writes a letter of recommendation. Yeah, of course. Yeah. And, um, but I guess Matt must have used my LOR at lots of schools and Richmond's the only one that actually sent this out. So hmm. now we're talking about Richmond on the podcast. There you go. Interesting. So 
Good job, University of Richmond School of Law. <laughs> they're they're super hustling to try to get uh, the best class they can. Which you know what? I mean, that's a point in their favor. Yeah. Right. You don't want to go to a school that's not going to do a good job hustling for talent. Yeah. So they're out there hustling. So that's good. <laughs> the, their capitalization and punctuation in this email though is concerning. Capitalizing things generally. When in doubt, just don't. Thank you for your capitalized letter of recommendation. What the uh, hell? Yeah, <laughs> mm-hmm. I don't understand. yeah they and, then they, yeah. and the way they capitalized admissions committee yeah. and then later just committee. Oh yeah, they, they also capitalized the just committee. the word committee. Gee, you really think you're that great? <clears throat> you got to humble yourself a little bit too, and not capitalize. Very People do all this all the time Trumpian. with their titles, right? Like they're like, oh, I was you know managing director. It's like that's lowercase, dude. Um, it's not capitalized, but <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. Even like her signature is pretty funny too. Michelle Heck, associate dean of admissions, office of admissions, <laughs> University of Richmond School of Law. <laughs> like, yeah, I assume I would assume that you're in the office of admissions, but okay. Um, anyway, we're poking fun. Sorry, right? sorry this Michelle, is actually a very you. nice email. If this gets back to Michelle Heck, I think you sound like a very nice person, and I'm glad you sent me this email. Yeah. Um, Hmm. Okay, this, <laughs> thank you. Yeah, I, she didn't write in, but thank you for sharing, Matt or Nathan. Thank you. Thanks, yeah, yeah. This, thanks to this Matt to for me. sharing it with you. I guess no, 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 no you no, just it came got to it. me. Yeah. Okay. Geez. Yeah, I didn't even ask him for permission, so yeah, now did. he's probably pissed at me for putting he's this like, on the what, podcast. Why the hell are you telling everybody about this? <laughs> oh well. Um, last question. Last question. Religious law schools. Okay. Could you see if? Um, weather could you see whether the guys would want to talk about the religious affiliation aspect of some law schools as an atheist will i be an outcast if i went to pepperdine would i start adopting the catholic guilt at georgetown well that's a stupid question obviously not okay that last one was a joke oh yeah sorry i'm jumping ahead here (laughs) but really how much of a role does religion play in the law school experience in religion affiliated schools Many thanks, Carolyn. I don't, well, okay, I can talk about Georgetown a little bit. I didn't go there, but there's a okay. lot of people who go to Georgetown and there's no mention of Catholicism. I mean, yeah, I'm not saying that they don't talk about Catholicism at school, but people don't think twice about that. So I don't think you're going to encounter issues. Um, one thing you could easily do is just search the percentage of people who go to Georgetown and have religious affiliation. The smaller the number, you know, obviously the less important the religion is to the student body. And even then, how many people are practicing versus just identifying with that religious group? So I don't know. I wouldn't think twice about it. Can you say anything um, about BYU as like a sort of a difference yeah byu is going to be different um i mean if you talk about the numbers there too i think it's like 98 percent or something like that are going to be mormon so yeah r- and they relig- charge less apparently for lds members they do they charge less so yeah i think that might be the exception but i i think most religious oriented schools that it's not gonna. It's not gonna be a big deal. That said, if you're gonna con- seriously consider going to school, ask them if they have some sort of honor code or some sort of, you know, requirement to fulfill that's religiously oriented. You know, like they might require you to take a religion class. I have no idea. Yeah. So, and does that? But does that even matter? Just take if it's just like one class, just take it and be like, huh, that's their perspective. Great. Thanks. Yeah. It it's gonna vary school by school. I mean. I mentioned recently uh, I had a, a student applying to Pepperdine and they had a scholarship, a special scholarship application where you had to like specifically mention how you were going to advance the Christian mission of the university. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. So yeah. then it's obviously more important to that school. I, that's a That's a good point too. What are they asking you in your application? I think it will yeah. kind of, I think it, the more you interact with them and look at their website, the more obvious it will be like, are they holding out the religion as an important part of their identity or not? Yeah. Um, 
I Googled this quickly before the show. Okay, yeah. And I found a couple of interesting things. I think if you just go ahead and Google religious law schools, you'll find these same articles. One is from the um, the Above the Law blog, and it's actually from Ellie Mistal, who is one of the hosts of the Above the Law podcast. Sure. Um, we still need to try to get Ellie on the show because he'd obviously be a great guest. If anybody has a connection to that show or to Ellie, um, you know, try to get him to to come on the show with us. I think we're aligned in lots of stuff, <laughs> including sense of humor. But um, it, Ellie wrote an article called "This Was Back from 2014," but it says religious law school rankings. Does your law school make Jesus happy? Which schools are the best for the faithful? Or is that the dumbest question you've heard today? And he's basically just mocking, um, I guess, National Jurist Pre-Law Magazine had done a, a ranking of which schools are best for Catholics, Christians, Jews, and Muslims. Oh, and Mormons. Okay. <laughs> and he was just kind of mocking it because um, it, it was like, it seemed, I guess, I get, well, I'm, I mean, he's, I think Ellie is an atheist. He says he's a uh, nominally a Catholic, but I think he's actually probably an atheist or agnostic at the at, at most. Um, he was mocking it because it, the best schools for people of these various religions didn't actually seem to be related at all to the ranking, the like national ranking of the schools. Mm, yeah. And in fact, it was actually the the opposite of the rankings, <laughs> the actual rankings for the schools in in most of the cases. It looks like, yeah. Point being, like if you're going to a law school because of your religion, you're, uh, I don't know, the odds are you're going to like learn less about the way legal practice really works. Because it's a um, lower ranked school. Is that what you're saying? It's just, well, yeah, what is it? What is it? Is it a lower ranked school because it teaches religion or is it because it's a, because it is lower ranked, then it's allowed to teach religion? You get my point? Mm, no, I'm not totally following, actually. Well, it's just like if these two, if these are causally related, yeah. which one is the cause and which one is the effect? That's what I'm saying. Sure, sure. Yeah. Like when you're a real low ranked school that nobody gives a shit about, then you can do whatever you want. Yeah. On the other hand, if you do whatever the hell you want, I think it tends to lead to a low ranking. Can we That's pull up that, that ranking? Was it from the National Jurist? Um, yeah, I mean, and it's like super old. I don't even know if this link is going to still be alive. Let's see. Oh yeah. No, the, <laughs> that link is now, is now dead in, uh, Ellie's article. I also found a thing from, this is much more recent, uh, from 2019. I found a blog post called 2019 law, sorry, 2019 religious law school rankings. Okay. This is from the tax prof, uh, blog. Yeah which actually comes from Pepperdine. This dude is apparently a professor at Pepperdine. Okay. Um, um, Paul. W and it says, uh, yes, this is, uh, who wrote this Paul. He's Karen. A dean. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yep. And he wrote, so this is, um, Oh yeah. Oh, whoa. This is interesting. Okay. Ranking by how devout they are, which actually is probably what the, uh, correspondent carolyn really cares about is like which schools are are uh, which schools are actually devout and which schools are not devout yeah carolyn is an uh, atheist and doesn't want to go to a religious school probably i don't so see this is georgetown like, on any of these lists <laughs> yeah no they're uh, right they're clearly yeah, this looks like the thing that people should really look at is this uh tax prof blog article yeah but it has like most devout christian law schools starting from the top liberty regent trinity then byu pepperdine oh this it is says, interesting mm -hmm. oh yeah this is what you're about to read about pepperdine right yeah. yes and okay. so i thought the people yeah so this one is uh one of the more devout schools at pepperdine social events and official ceremonies begin with prayer that's a significant part of the school's culture quote it is not unusual that business meetings will likewise be convened with a request to God for prudence, understanding, and guidance, the school's website notes. Many of Pepperdine's professors and administrators take the time to spiritually encourage and pray with students and others who need the care that those who profess faith are called to give. 
Pepperdine is affiliated with Churches of Christ, but students of all faiths are welcome. Huh. Yeah, these schools are serious. I See, I w- when I was thinking about religious schools, when this question was first brought to my attention to five minutes ago, <laughs> yeah. I was thinking about Georgetown. And I'm like, I don't, like at Georgetown, I just don't think they think too much. It's like, a, it seems like an afterthought. I didn't go there. I don't know for sure, but it's not something that everyone that anyone ever seems to talk about. Um, I'm sh- They do have that affiliation. I mean, they were founded by, cl- you know, a Catholic missionaries, I think, a long yeah, time ago or something like that. there's a difference between founded yeah. by and, like, actually continuing to practice that stuff. What about, this has Santa Clara on there. I yep. have no idea. That's a Jesuit school. Mm-hmm. Oh, okay. Wait, yeah. these are most devout Christian schools, and then you have a list of the most devout Catholic schools. Which are, there's um, an, obviously an overlap between Catholics and Christians, but... I wouldn't imagine... Wait, so this... I'm really curious. You mentioned Muslims earlier. I don't... That see. was on Ellie's thing, and apparently that <laughs> other... I think it's an outdated... Well, I mean, and Ellie's point in that blog post was basically like, hey, good job, Muslims, because there's not actually schools that are targeted toward Muslims. It seems as if this ranking basically just picked out the best schools, period. Or yeah. the schools where nobody gives a shit. Yeah. You know, and then it just ranked it based on, hey, here's the good schools at the top. So I found that kind of interesting. That is interesting. Let's include this link, I guess, huh? In the yeah. Show notes. I, we can put both of these links in the show notes. That's easy. Yeah. That's a long way of saying we don't really know, but I hope you enjoyed our <laughs> speculations and random Google searching. <laughs> yeah. Good luck. <laughs> cool. Uh, anything else that uh, needs to make it onto the show today? I don't think so. That's okay. it. Okay. Um, Go ahead and join our Thinking LSAT podcast group on Facebook if Facebook is your thing. It's not my thing, but if it's your thing, you should be uh, talking to the Thinking LSAT people in our podcast group. Uh, We are at Thinking LSAT on social media, including Instagram and Twitter. I'm at InFox on Twitter, and I actually kind of look at Twitter. So if you want to look me up on Twitter, that's the place to find me. That's the only social media thing that I really use. Ben, I guess you use Instagram. You're at Innovator Ben on Instagram if you want to slide into Ben's DMs. Um, <laughs> you can visit strategyprep.com and foxlsat.com to learn about our services, including live classes in uh, Ben's in DC. I'm in LA and San Francisco teaching live classes and all sorts of online and one-on-one options uh, available via our websites. Um, more importantly, you can just go to lsatdemon.com and do a free trial. As we said earlier at the top of the show, the LSAT Demon is everything you need for LSAT prep. Um, I really do believe that. So if you're wondering what class to take or wondering how to get started or you're wondering what books to buy, don't bother with any of it. Just go to lsatdemon.com and uh, do the free trial. If you like the free trial, do a month. Uh, if you like a month, I think that's all you're going to ever need for LSAT prep is just the Demon. Yeah. You can listen all sorts of ways. Um, we're on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, YouTube, Stitcher, thinkinglsat.com. We're all over the place. Find us, subscribe, rate us, review us, do all the things, please. It really helps. That was episode 233 of the Thinking LSAT podcast. Thanks, all y'all, for listening. Nice knowing you. Don't pay for law school. Yeah.